In today's video I'm going to be talking about rendering for visual effects using Blender. I've been using Blender for quite a long time now and anybody else that uses it is also going to know that the community is really really incredible and there's lots of really good tutorials and things out there and lots of very good information. But for doing advanced visual effects things in Blender it's a bit of a grey area because Blender's not really supposed to be like a competing visual effects software. Although I think these days Blender could probably give Maya a run for its money. And so in this video I wanted to talk about the things that I've learned about specifically outputting render passes and the optimal settings for rendering and things for using for visual effects assets. So what I'm going to try and do is go over the best optimum settings to create high quality renders while not rendering anything unnecessarily so you can reduce render time while maintaining a good quality. I'm going to talk about outputting the render passes so that you can do shader rebuilds and things in post production when you're compositing. And then I'm also going to talk about creating some custom tools using shaders like the position pass which I'll talk about later. Before I start I'm going to say in the description is a link to an Etsy page that I created and on that page is going to be a couple of files that you can download and they're essentially the startup files like a template that I've made. So essentially you'll be able to download them and it's going to have all of the settings that I'm going to set up in this video as a default and all you have to do once you've opened it is go to file and save startup file and that means that every time you open Blender it's going to have all of this stuff already configured. And the reason I'm doing this and making it as a template and stuff for other people to use is that when I was doing this I used to set it up every time and it used to take me sort of 20 minutes of figuring things out and doing some test renders and stuff. The template essentially takes all of the guesswork out of wondering what's going to happen when you hit render and in that download link for Etsy I've included a startup file for 2.8 and 2.79. So let's start in the scene tab. One of the most important things for visual effects rendering that a lot of people don't realize is that you have to change your color space settings. By default, Blender renders into a color space called Rec 709, and that's pretty commonly used, like a lot of cameras and things shoot in Rec 709. But the problem is that the way Blender renders, you lose a lot of the dynamic range in your scene, and the render might just look really contrasty and it doesn't really sit into the scene because the, the kind of dynamic range isn't there to make it look like it was captured by a decent camera. So Blender has this built-in color setting called Filmic, which is essentially replicating like a, a a log profile which means that the camera shoots with very low contrast. So if you change your display device to sRGB, if you use Rec 709 it won't work. If you change to sRGB, change uh, the view transform to filmic, it's going to give you a load of options here. I have mine set to very low contrast. I'd recommend probably going for one of the lower ones because it's going to give you more dynamic range. And then change your sequencer to linear. I think by default it's filmic log, change it to linear. Linear essentially means that there's no curves or anything when you're changing your exposures, it goes up in a straight line. I haven't explained that amazingly, but if you're interested, look it up. Okay, light path. This is a very important one, and a lot of people talk about this when they talk about optimizing your renders in Blender. By default, these are sort of spread out between sort of values of 12 and 8, and a lot of the time in your scenes you don't need them. So you can see here we have a number of light paths for diffuse, glossy, transparency, transmission and volume. The point of this is that you can turn these right down. So I have mine on about three or four and I usually change it a little bit depending on what I'm rendering. So for example, for a project I've been working on today and yesterday, um, I actually turned off my transparency and transmission light paths because I wasn't rendering anything in my scene that had any transparency or transmission materials. And so if you turn these off or turn them right down, it just means that it takes less for Blender to calculate each frame and render it. I turn the diffuse and glossy down a little bit as well, just because the, the difference in quality is negligible between like six and three. I also turn off reflective and refractive caustics. Now, I'm not a physicist, but I'm pretty sure the right way to explain this is that caustics are when light is passing through things like glass and the light is refracting and it creates those kind of like sparkly textures and things. I'll show a couple of photos now of what it looks like. This is actually a really heavy thing to have to compute in CG. Even if there aren't any really happening in your scene, Blender's still going to be looking for it before it can say, okay, no, there's none in this frame, so I won't render them. If you turn them off, it just takes out some of that guesswork and again, will maybe save you a, a second or so per frame on your render. Volumes is one that I use quite a bit and it's a really handy one to know. This is referring again to, like I said earlier, when you're rendering smoke or you have volumetric lighting or something in your scene. But one of the ways that I've discovered to make your renders a little bit faster is to turn up the step size. The default it's set to is 0.1 and I'd normally change mine to about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 and it just seems to make it a little bit easier to render. I don't know whether it's like doing some less calculations per frame or whatever, but I actually can't tell the difference. Motion blur. This is another really important one, especially if you're doing compositing. So by default, I believe motion blur is turned on and the shutter is set to 0 0.5. I actually turn this off because I add my motion blur in post-production when I'm compositing. The quality is pretty much always going to be better if you render it straight out of your 3D program but the problem is it's baked in then you have no control. The beauty of turning it off is you can render a pass called a vector pass which then gives you control over the motion blur when you're doing the compositing and it means that you can take your render and change the motion blur as you want so you don't have to re-render each time which is really helpful. So to allow Blender to output a vector pass you have to turn off motion blur. If you want to composite what you're making onto a live action background or just any background you want to have 
transparency so what you render is opaque and then the background in blender like this stuff here is transparent to do that under the film tab you literally just turn on transparency then we have performance again this is something that's going to change your render times quite a bit especially if you have a graphics card the tile sizes here are set to about 64 and that's really set up for when you're using your cpu to render stuff it renders lots of small squares at the same time so you can do like eight or nine depending on how many cores you have in your computer so if you make your tile sizes bigger the graphics card can essentially render big chunks of the frame and you might think, well, what's the difference? Because it's rendering the whole frame anyway. But it does actually make quite a big difference to your render times. And if you look this up on YouTube, you can see some tests that people have done in the past. I think that's pretty much everything we need to do in the first tab. So now we can move on to render layers. So down here under the passes tab, there's all of these options that you can turn on and off that control the, the different light passes that get outputted when you're rendering. In order to be able to have access to these when you're compositing, you have to make sure that you're rendering to an open EXR multi-layer file format. So to do that, go under the output tab and change the file format to open EXR multi-layer, enable RGBA so you have the alpha and the transparency information. You can change the color depth to float half or float full. Float half is just gonna be smaller file sizes, so maybe if you wanna conserve some space on your hard drive. But if you're gonna be using things like the position pass that I'm gonna be talking about in a second, it's better to render with float full for your color depth because it gives you more accuracy in compositing. Okay, so back to the passes. So down here, like we were doing for the light passes, we have diffuse, glossy, transmission, and subsurface and volume. By default, I have pretty much all of these turned on all the time. But again, if I'm rendering something that I know doesn't have any glass materials in the scene, I'll turn off the transmission passes just because I won't need them. And this will just help to declutter all of the layers and stuff when you're doing your compositing later. But let's say for this example that I'm using all of them. So first of all, up here under data, we have combined, which is just like your RGBA, the default render of what it's gonna look like when it comes out. Then there's a Z depth pass, which essentially gives you a grayscale image and it's like a gradient going backwards in 3D space. And it tells your compositing software how far away from the camera the objects are. So it gives you some actual depth information, essentially. Strangely in Blender, there's a Z pass and a mist pass and the Z pass doesn't actually seem to work. So I do my compositing in Nuke. So so I have mist enabled instead of Z, and I literally just rename this at the render stage, which I'll show later. Then there's the normal pass, which you can use in compositing to relight your object sometimes if you want to. This is the vector pass that I was talking about for the motion blur. Then there's UVs, which you can use to retexture your 3D renders in 2D space, which is really cool. So say you have like a, a, a billboard in 3D that you've rendered, but you didn't know what artwork was going to go on at the time, you could use the normals pass to basically put like a different sign or something on there that wasn't there in the render. Then right at the bottom we have denoising. I am kind of torn about denoising at the moment. I used to use it for everything and then recently I've discovered that sometimes it's quite destructive to the image. So that's the beauty render which is all of the main objects in the scene so that's going to output all of the information that you need to slap everything back together in compositing. But I also have render passes for the shadows and the utilities. So for the shadow pass, this is literally just to isolate the shadows. And all this is gonna be is any of the objects in the scene that are set up as shadow catchers, which is under the objects tab. Um, you go under cycle settings at the bottom and turn on shadow catcher. This means that the object itself won't render, but any shadows that are cast onto it will be isolated so you can render them on their own. So if I do a quick example, I will make this uh, floor a shadow catcher. So if I do a quick render of the scene, I've turned off the cube in the render, so it's just creating the shadow, but not actually showing up. And then lastly is my utility setup. This is the one that contains the position pass and I also normally tend to render my normals and vectors and UVs and stuff into this as well. But the main reason I've done this as a separate pass is because the main RGB channel that gets rendered is going to be a position pass material. And what the position pass is, is a gradient that gets assigned across the entire scene so everywhere in 3D space has a unique colour value. So if I hit render you'll see that there's loads of like crazy colours that happen, it looks really cool. The way the position pass works is it's just a shader that assigns the gradients across the entire scene and then it goes through an emission to make the colors shadeless and then it has like an is camera ray light thing going into it to control the factor. It's very very cool and very handy. I think that covers all of the settings that you want to be able to change for visual effects so now we need to change where all the passes are going. If we go to the compositor, this is the custom file output setup that I've made. So here we have three render layer nodes. One is for the beauty, one is for the shadows, and one is for the utility. And then next to them I have file output nodes. And this is what I was talking about, about hitting render and rendering multiple channels and layers at once. Originally in Blender, when I used to do my rendering, I would render the beauty, and then I would change some settings over here, and then render the shadows, and then change some settings, and then render the utility. And it's fine to do that, but the problem is that once one finishes, you have to come back and then like switch it over to do the next lot. The way this works is that you can set up what folders you want the renders for each pass to go into before you hit render, and then once you hit render, it does them all at the same time. So to do that, you have the render layers node and the file output node. In the file output node, you click the folder and then you select wherever you want to put it on your hard drive. And then all of the outputs on this node that are labeled here are coming from the passes that we set up and enabled in our render layers tabs. So I go back into the beauty and I turn off the diffuse. You can see that they disappear over here. And if I turn them back on, they reappear. So then 
In the file output node under properties, you can choose the names for all of them. If I just add a new file output node over here, it starts off with literally just image. And I rename this to RGBA. So you plug the image into there and that works fine. And then essentially you just add an input and change the name for each of these passes. So again, this is a bit annoying and this is why I've just created that template for you guys to use if you want it. It saves you going through this process, but you make like an ambient occlusion pass and then plug the ambient occlusion into there and so on for all of these. The shadow one is literally just an RGBA output. So you literally just want the alpha channel for the shadows. So you can use it to grade the floor or whatever you're doing with it. And then for the utilities, we have the position pass, which is the RGBA image. So that's what this looks like. And then we have our normals and UVs and vectors and stuff in there as well. So once all of that stuff is going into the correct folders, you can press render animation and it will set off the render. And then you should come back at some point and your file should be there. I'm going to jump into Nuke really quickly and show how some of these passes can be used in compositing. Okay, so I've jumped over to Nuke and I've done a quick render of a test scene. So I've got my beauty layer, my shadow layer and my utility layer. So the beauty is pretty self-explanatory. It's got all of the diffuse and glossy lighting passes and stuff that, like we talked about earlier. So the main thing I wanted to show is what you would use the position pass for. So there's a third party node for Nuke that you can download, which is called a PMAT, and I'm sure you can do the same thing in other softwares. So you plug the image input into your position pass, and then you use the color picker, and you can select any area of the frame. So let's say I wanted to grade down here, so I control and right click. And so in the alpha channel, we can see it's created a little area that's masked out. And then you can see if I scale this up, you can actually change the size of the mask. So this is super useful and it's including the cube and the plane and everything. But that's really, really handy. So then I can use this as an alpha mask. So if I plug a grade into my beauty render. I can use that position pass as a mat and literally just grade that section so I can make that darker. So that's what you would use a position pass for. So I think that covers pretty much everything we need to go over. So with that knowledge, hopefully you'll be able to speed up your renders and kick out some really useful passes for compositing. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I was going to point out one more time, if you want to go to the link in the description and pick up the templates that I made, they're on Etsy. They're really cheap, they're £2.40, which is about $3 in the US. I was kind of torn about making them free or not. In the end, I just settled on a price that I thought would be cheap enough that anyone could buy it if they wanted to. And it would also give me some kickback, which would help me with making videos like this in the future. So I hope you guys found this useful and I'll see you next time.